Abstain from fornication. For this is the will of God, it says there in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. Now if you wanted a second title to tonight's sermon, it's basically this. Sins that will get you kicked out of church, part one. <laughs> All right? Sins that will get you kicked out of church, part one. And it's on fornication. Okay, now uh, I do want to have a series on this. I do want to cover these major sins that will literally get you kicked out of church. And some people really struggle with this concept. You know, people say, well, you can't kick... You know, the church is for everybody. You know, you should have the doors open. Anybody should be welcome to church. No, there are some people who are in sin where God commands us not to do anything with that person, all right? And to put them away from the church, okay? So this is a series that I want to work through. It may not be back-to-back -back sermons. I might interrupt it with different sermons. Um, but ideally, I want to go through this list of sermons. Please turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. Now, do you think I want to kick people out of this church? Do you think I'm preaching this and I'm going to preach a series because I want to kick people out of the church? Of course not, right? The, the reason we preach these things is that we would not do these sins, right? That we would be aware that these sins are so serious in the eyes of God that we need to actually, you know, get rid of that person out of that church. But 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, and this Corinthian church was messed up at this point in time. They were really messed up. But he says this in verse number 9, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Okay? Now just to give you a little bit of context here, when Paul says, I wrote unto you an epistle, he's not talking about the first Corinthians epistle. He's not talking about that book of the Bible. Okay? Now that can sound confusing, but Paul had written prior to writing 1 Corinthians to, the, to this church and told them, hey, I told you in a previous epistle not to, for, not to company with fornicators, okay? But that, that epistle was not recorded as canon, you know, as, as part of the canon of Scripture. Maybe he wasn't, you know, maybe he wasn't moved by the Holy Ghost. Whatever God's reason are, is, you know, we don't have that first 1 Corinthians book, okay? Uh, but then he says this in verse number 10, Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. So the warning that Paul gave the Corinthian church before 1 Corinthians is not to company with people of the world. Okay, talking about unbelievers here, people that are not in the church, people that are in the world, not to company with people that are fornicators, covetous, extortioners, idolaters. That was the message of his first epistle. But then when he wrote 1 Corinthians, we see why further, what further instruction he adds to the church. In verse 11, verse 11, But now, now I have written unto you, not to keep company with any man that is called a brother, be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such and one know not to eat. Okay? So he said, don't company with these people that are in the world, that are unbelievers. Don't be friends with these kind of people. Don't associate with these kind of people. But now he takes it to another level. He says, but now I write to you not to come to company with these kind of sinners that are Christians, that are called a brother in the church. Do you see how he takes it to that next level? Okay? So it seems to me from what I can gather, and again, if you know the Corinthian church at this point in time, they were really messed up with sin, really messed up with doctrine, and uh, it seems like Paul had to warn them not to associate with sinners of the world, okay? But my take on this is that they did to the point where they were influenced and brought those sins into the church, okay? So Paul had to be very careful and instruct the church not to company with brothers saved that are in these sins, Okay? Look at verse number 12. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Now, let me just quickly give you some, uh, a, a tip here. When you're reading your Bible and you see these words without or within, that basically means often, when, especially if it's an epistle to the church, those that are without are people that are outside of the church, people that are not members of the church, you know, basically the world. And those that are within are believers, are, are brethren, brothers and sisters in the Lord that are in the church. Okay, so you've got to sometimes get used to that idea. 
Um, the Bible also says in Hebrews that Christ suffered without the gate. That means outside of the gates of Jerusalem, he was crucified on the cross. So, you know, sometimes that, that English is used without, within, not the way we commonly use it today. But yeah, Paul says in verse 12, For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Like, what, what do I have to do with those that are outside of the church, the world? I, you know, I, I'm not there to judge them. But then he says, Do not ye judge them that are within? He says, look, we are instructed to judge people within the church. We are supposed to make judgment calls and make decisions within the church. You know, we have nothing to do with the people outside of church, but we do have some control and some authority within the church, and we ought to judge people within the church, those that are within. Verse 13, But them that are without, so those that are outside of the church, God judgeth. Okay? Those that are in sin outside of the ch church, God judges them. God takes care of that business, right? Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Okay? Put away from among yourselves, talking to the church, that wicked person. So people that are in these sins, fornication, covetous, extortioners, idolaters, uh, drunkards, railers, these people must be put outside, outside of the church, must be kicked out of the church. And when I say they're kicked out of the church, I literally mean that that person is physically out of that church, right? Because some people interpret these passages and they have a members list. You know, they have a, a list of... And I'm not against the list of members. Don't get me wrong. I'm not against having a list of people that are in the church, that serve in the church, and, and the membership. I'm not, a, not again, I don't think it's a sin to have those things. I don't think it's biblical. I just don't think it's a sin. Okay? It's, it's something maybe practical. Okay, makes sense for some churches. That's fine. But what they do is when they kick people out of the church, many times, they just cross them off the list. You know, you're no longer a member. You're still, you're still allowed to be part of the church. But, you know, your, your name's crossed out. You're no longer officially a member of the church. No. <laughs> what did the Bible say? Therefore, put away from among yourselves, not from your list, not from your members list, from among yourselves, that wicked person. And these sins, my friends, these sins are sins that are commonly done throughout the world. These sins are so acceptable in the world, but to God, he says, this is wickedness. This is so wicked. You've got to get rid of it out of your church. Okay? And you say, well, why is that? I'll tell you why. Because if you allow people in this wickedness to be in the church, they're going to influence others in the church. Someone that's fornicating with his girlfriend, they're going to influence other people, especially the young people, to, to think, hey, that's the norm. That's acceptable. That's fine. You know, I can fornicate with my girlfriend or my boyfriend. Right? Drunkards, you know, they don't just want to get drunk on their own they're more likely to pass on the alcohol and get other people drunk with them, right? These people often want to part get other people to participate in their sins. And that's why you kick them out of the church, okay? Now, again, I've said this before in a previous sermon. It's done as a, a type of um, judgment, correction, chastisement within the church. The ideal scenario is that person will get right with God, will get right on these things, repent from those sins, okay? do away with that, come back, apologize to the church, and they'll be more than welcome back, okay? They're not kicked out forever. Oh, I mean, as long as, you know, they turn from those, those, that wickedness, right? But it would be right for them, and we see this practice happening in, in Corinthians, we won't go into it now, but it's right for them to apologize, be brought back into fellowship, be forgiven, and for that not to be brought up once again, okay? It's been dealt with, you know, and uh, we move on from there. Now, look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 8. Because fornication, you know, maybe, maybe one generation ago, fornication was a sin. Uh, you know, I mean, as far as my parents' generation is concerned, yeah. You know, you know, having sex before marriage, definitely a sin, very wicked, very disgraceful, very, uh, you know, you, you lose your honor, you know, you, you taint the family name, especially if a woman gets pregnant outside of wedlock. You know, it was really bad. You know, once upon a time, that was a shame to our culture, okay? But today, people are shacking up, committing fornication. It's the norm, okay? People will recommend to you, hey, you don't need to get married. Just live together for a while, see how it goes. And then if you like, if you like each other that much, then get married, right? So this needs to be preached on. 
because the world at large and our kids are growing up in a society where this is acceptable and they need to know that this is a great wickedness to God. We want to see exactly how wicked it is to God. So 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 8. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. What's three and twenty thousand? Twenty-three thousand. I'll read it again. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them... Who are the them? This is a reference to Old Testament Israel. As some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. So how many people died in one day over this sin? 23,000. Keep that in mind. Now turn to Numbers 25. Numbers 25. Because we want to go back. You know, the, the wrongs, the sins that Old Testament Israel did are there for our learning. Okay, they did some disgraceful and horrible things. But they're written in the Bible so we in the New Testament can look back and learn from their mistakes. And so we don't make the same mistakes. Numbers 25 verse 1. Numbers 25, verse 1. This is the story of where Israel committed fornication and in one day, 23,000 of them died. Numbers 25, verse 1 reads, And Israel abode in Shittim. Now, let me just give you a quick context here. Israel's been obviously delivered out of Egypt. They're about to cross into the promised land. land. Okay, they're not far from going into that promised land that God had promised them, that God had you know, given them as a blessing, you know, a place where they're going to have their land, they're going to live there, and, uh, and uh, you know, basically be blessed. And uh, yeah, the promises that God gave to Israel, they, they were on the verge of crossing into that promised land. And this is what happened to Israel. And the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. Okay, that, that whoredom is fornication. Verse number two. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bow down to their gods. So they saw the men of Israel, saw these daughters of Moab, thought they were very attractive, right? These daughters made themselves available to them, but on the condition that they would sacrifice to idols, that they would worship the gods of Moab rather than the God of Israel. Okay, this, was, this wasn't just an illicit sexual act. They went all the way and worshipped another god. Look at verse number 3. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. This angered the Lord. His people are committing whoredom with these people and worshipping the gods of, of them. And this is going to happen the same thing to you, young people. If you find yourself committing whoredom and fornication with, and the unworldly with someone that's not a believer, you're going to have your heart drawn away from God and you're going to worship the things that they worship. You're going to love the things that they love more than love the God of the Bible. You must understand it's not just this one sin, but it will lead your heart away from the Lord God. And the Lord, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Verse number four. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun. Think about this. God is asking Moses to kill these fornicators. Hang their heads before the Lord against the sun that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. Do you see how much God hates this sin of fornication, this sin of whoredom? Verse number 5, And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one of his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. And by the way, sorry, that ba Baal, that's, that's Satan. That's a false god. Baal Peor is, I think it's just another name, or Peor is, is the place they were worshipping Satan. I don't have a full understanding of that, but it's obviously the, where they're worshipping Satan here. Verse number 6, And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianite, Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So this one individual, a child of Israel, now just openly, not even 
not even in secret, right? Not even ashamed, but he openly brings this, this woman, this brings this whore, right? He's, he's a whore himself, right? He's a whoremonger himself. Brings in the sight of Moses, right? In the sight of all the congregation of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle. I'm not sure what this weeping was. I'm assuming they're weeping because of this great sin that Israel had done. But before the door of the tabernacle, where God's presence was, where the Ark of the Covenant, or not, the Ark of the Covenant has not been made yet, but the, uh, but the Lord's presence was there before the tabernacle where they were doing the sacrifices. Before there, right, that's like, that's like allowing fornicators into your church, right? They come before the door of the house of God, just openly in their fornication, and what was to be done with this person, right? You see how bold he was? You see how bold he was to bring this woman, this whorish woman, into Israel. But look at verse number 7. And when Phineas, and Phineas is a good man. Phineas is a godly man. Phineas is a man who's offended by what he sees. And when Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, so Aaron's grandson, saw it, <clears throat> he rose up, from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand, like a spear, a javelin, right? He takes that javelin in his hand, verse 8, and he went after the man of Israel into the tent. So this man's committed whoredom with this woman in the tent. He takes his javelin, goes after him, and thrusts both of them through. He stabs that javelin, that spear, straight through that woman and that man and thrusts both of them through the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. Now one thing that's not very clear here in this chapter of Numbers is that God's anger was so sore against Israel that he actually brought this plague upon Israel. Okay? Because this is the first mention that you'll see of the plague. It kind of comes out of nowhere. But if you read other chapters in Numbers, you'll understand that God did bring upon this plague. And so not only did these 23,000 die in one day because they were slain, but they were also dying because of this plague that God brought upon the nation. So God sees this righteous act, right, done. And, uh, and then look at verse number 9. And those that died in the plague were 20 and 4,000. Now I just want to touch on something very briefly here, okay? Because some people say there are contradictions in the Bible, right? How many died in the, in the plague according to God in the New Testament? 23,000, right? What does it say here? And those that died in the plague were 20 and 4,000. People will mock the Bible and say, well, see, there's a contradiction. No, because in Corinthians, it said, uh, neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed and fell in one day, three and 20,000. Okay, so in the first day of this plague, in the first day of this slaying of these people, there died 23,000. That means 1,000 died later on. You know, it's kind of like a tragedy. You might see, you know, let's say that there's a bombing or something and you'll find out, you know, 20 people died, seven are in hospital with serious injuries. But then later, you know, in a day or two, you'll find that those that were injured, you know, some of those passed away. So the numbers of death goes higher. So in the first day, 23,000 of Israel were killed either by the sword, by the spear, I don't know if there was anyone else did that, or by the plague. But then another thousand died of Israel afterwards. Okay. And verse number 10, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, hath turned my wrath away from the children of Israel, while he was zealous for my sake among them, that I consume not the children of Israel in my jealousy. So God's saying, look, I was on the verge of consuming the children of Israel in my jealousy. God was on the verge of just destroying Israel, being done with it, just starting all over again, killing them all. But Phineas steps in and takes matters into his own hand, does a righteous act, and that appeases God. He sees that you know, there are righteous people in my nation, right? So we just see, you know, I draw your attention to that because the New Testament tells us that story is there for our example. We read about it and we see how serious fornication is in the sight of God, okay? Now, does God go around killing everyone and, and putting a plague on everyone that's committed fornication? No. You know, so many times in the Bible you'll see things that happen the first time and you see God's severe anger, severe judgment. That ought to put in your mind how God feels about it. Okay? Now, other times he might not judge as harshly or may let it go, you know, 
we, we assume he lets it go, but that doesn't change the fact of how God feels about those sins. Now, I don't know if you've, I should have told you to keep it, stay in 1 Corinthians. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. <clears throat> because on this topic of fornication, the book of 1 Corinthians is probably the main book of the Bible that, to- that talks on this topic of fornication. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now, the sin of fornication isn't just any other sin. Okay? It is a sin, but it's not just any other sin. It is actually quite unique. Um, because when you sin, let, let's say I lie to you. Let's say I tell you a lie. I'm committing a sin against you, right? Or if I steal something from you, I'm committing a sin against you. Or if I worship an idol instead of worship God, I'm sinning against God. Okay? When you sin, you sin against other people. But the sin of fornication the Bible says, is a sin against your own self. The sin of fornication is a sin of your own body, against your own body. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, verse 18. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 18. Flee fornication. Very important. (laughs) Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. There's that term again, without. Remember, outside of. So every sin you do is outside of your body. You're sinning against somebody, you're sinning against your neighbor, or you're sinning against God. It's without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. You're actually committing sin, yes, with somebody, the person that you're fornicating with, but you're sinning against yourself. That's what makes the sin of fornication unique to other sins, every other sin. Why is it a sin against your own body? Verse 19, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Your body, if you're a believer, is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Okay, it's like the tabernacle of the Old Testament. The Holy Ghost comes and dwells in you, resides in you. You know, you're born of the Holy Ghost. He lives in you. He dwells in you for all eternity. God will be in you through the Holy Ghost there. And when you sin in fornication as a believer, yes, you're sinning with somebody, but you sin against your own body because that body belongs to God. Look at verse 20. For ye are bought with a price. You are bought with a price. You do not belong to yourself, my friend. Jesus Christ came, shed his blood, put a down payment for you. He purchased you with his own blood. You belong to God. You belong to Jesus Christ. Your body belongs to God. Okay, that's why he has the right to dwell in you. Okay, ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. What you do in your body belongs to God. Okay, your service toward God in your body belongs to Him. The work that you do Monday to Friday to provide for your own is a work for the Lord. Anything you do with your body, anything you do with your hands. You ought to have a mindset. I'm purchased by God. The Holy Ghost dwells in me. I am the temple of the living God. He's purchased me. I belong to Him. I ought to serve Him in all that I do. And that's why you need to keep your body clean and pure and not commit whoredom, not commit fornication with this world the way this world is. Reasons to abstain from fornication. Obviously, we know God hates it. We know it's a sin. But what are some other reasons to abstain from fornication? Let me give you a few reasons. Number one, it'll make you less desirable to a godly Christian spouse. Okay? It'll make you less desirable. Now, while you're single, okay, you ought to have the mind that, you know, I want to marry one day. I want to, you know, if you're a man, you want to marry a woman. If you're a woman, you want to marry a man. You know, if you're a Christian, you know, the other requirement is that you marry another Christian, right? Now, if... If you've committed whoredom, if you've committed fornication, right, and there's other men that have kept themselves pure for their wedding day, and there's a lady, a Christian lady, who do you think that lady would be more attracted to? Who do you think she would naturally be more inclined to? To the man that's committed fornication, to the man that's sinned against his own body, to the man that couldn't keep himself for his wedding day, or the man that's, that's keeping himself for his wife in his wedding day? You know, obviously it's going to reduce your appeal to the opposite sex. You know, I'm talking about Christians here, you know. Um, so, you know, don't make yourself less desirable than you need to, okay? That can damage your reputation as far as that is concerned. That can limit the people that may desire to marry you. But let me say this, 
If you marry someone that has committed fornication, you don't hold that against them anymore, right? That, that's been dealt with in the past. You're not to despise them any more than anything else. That's your husband. That's your wife. You love them. You submit to them. You love them as Christ, you know, the husbands love, you know, your wives as, as Christ loves the church. You know, that's dealt with, right? But I'm talking about the single person when they're ready to get married. Fornication is going to make you less desirable to the opposite sex, to, to a Christian person. The second reason to abstain from fornication is it'll increase, I'm sorry to say this, uh, maybe parents, you can correct me if I shouldn't talk about this now, but it's the truth. It'll increase your chance of catching STDs. Okay, I won't go into all of that, but let me just explain a couple of things to you. Okay, the human body, the human body was created for marriage. Okay, was created for that one spouse. God instituted marriage to be one man, one woman for life. That's what your human body has been created for. Okay, and obviously, if your spouse this happens, passes away, you're a widow, you can get, get remarried. But let me let's put, let's put it this way you know, your body's limited with how many people it is to be together with, basically, all right? It is limited. But the fornicators of this world, you know, they have dozens of relationships, they have hundreds of relationships, and many times they're filled with STDs and they don't even know it, okay? Now, let me just give you a little bit of a biblical reason for this. Uh, you don't need to turn there, I'll just read it to you very quickly. Leviticus 15, okay? Leviticus, Le Leviticus 15 talks a lot about the washing, being washed and... Uh, uh, before you enter into the tabernacle of God. But Leviticus 15 verse 16 says this. Every word of God is pure, right? <laughs> so Leviticus 15 verse 16. And if any man's seed of copulation go out from him, then he shall wash all his flesh in water and be unclean until the even. Okay? So that seed of copulation, that's the seed of the man being with the woman. The Bible says that man has to wash himself once, once he's done uh, that deed, and, and he was, he's unclean until the evening. He's un unclean until the evening. Verse 17, And every garment and every skin whereon is the seed of copulation shall be washed with water and be unclean until the evening. To the even. The woman also, with whom man shall lie with seed of copulation, they shall both bathe themselves in water and be unclean until the even. Now, what it means to be, like when the Bible talks about being unclean, it doesn't always refer to sin, okay? Um, you can do something that's unclean, but it doesn't mean you're doing anything sinful. There's nothing sinful, obviously, for a man and his wife to have that relationship, right? There's nothing sinful. But there is a period of time there where God says you're unclean, okay? When you're unclean, that means you're, there's, there's a tarnish, there's something that's not you know, there's something filthy, there's something there. Now, normally, in a normal marriage, that is not an issue, right? In a normal marriage, you know, you have the one partner, you know, you, you clean up afterwards, and, you know, you go on with your day. But there is this point where you are unclean, according to the Bible. And then when you have the fornicators of this world who are unclean, okay, because remember, fornication is a sin against your own body and against others, Okay? They don't respect their own body. They don't respect their own flesh. I doubt they're going to be clean, you know, have a cleanly you know, kind of righteous life you know, if they're going around partner after partner after partner, unclean, not necessarily washing themselves. Some people do things, you know, multiple partners in one night, just crazy things that happens in the world. It shouldn't surprise us then when we understand that God has a certain requirement of cleanliness that STDs breed throughout you know, these relationships, right? So I, I actually believe the Bible gives us this, these instructions so we would avoid STDs. Obviously, God tells us that one man, one woman for life in marriage, and that really shouldn't be a problem. But some of the STDs that are out there, HIV and AIDS, hepatitis, herpes, gonorrhea, these things shouldn't be, these things shouldn't exist. But they exist because of fornication. They exist because of illicit sexual acts and these people that do not respect themselves and not respect the body of others. You know, the human body is not designed for multiple sexual partners. It's not designed that way. That's not God's plan for our lives. Now, why did God give these laws of cleanliness in the Leviticus? Let me just read to you verse 31. Thus shall you separate the children of Israel from their uncleanness, that they die not in their uncleanness when they defile the tabernacle that is among them. 
So God had all these conditions, God had all these rituals and, and uh, ways of washing before you served in the tabernacle. Okay? Because again, I just repeat this over and over in many sermons, because many of the old things, many of the things in the Old Testament were pictures of things of the New Testament. The cleanliness, the washing, the righteousness, that represented the righteousness and the cleanliness of Jesus Christ because he was tainted without any sin, right? He was the righteous lamb of God. And obviously, the New Testament tabernacle is called, or the temple in the Old Testament is called the house of God. What's the house of God in the New Testament? The church, right? So we ought to also be considerate of these things, especially when we're dealing with people that are in the sin of fornication, in the sin of whoredom. The third reason why you shouldn't commit fornication, it'll just hurt your Christian testimony. Okay, your reputation as a Christian will take a beating. Okay, you, it'll embarrass you when the news comes out that you've committed fornication. It'll taint your reputation. It might even taint your family and the way they're seen by other people. Okay, okay? Now look, we're all sinners. We've all done mistakes. I get it, you know. But we need to be real about this and understand that this will taint your Christian testimony. It could pre prevent you from serving the Lord in a fuller capacity. Okay? Number four, the, the, the fourth reason not to commit fornication, it'll bring regrets and carry and make you carry unnecessary burdens in your life. Okay? Regrets in your life. Okay? And unnecessary burdens. Because in some cases, in some relationships, past fornication can bring regrets and hurt even in the marriage. Right? A godly man, a godly woman who's married, maybe one of those partners committed fornication in the past, they have regrets of that in the past, they have guilt of that in the past, they've been hurt in the past by you know, their former lover or whatever it is. It, it's because it's such an emotional thing. It's, such a, it's a union. You know, it's, it's the one flesh union that God speaks about. That, that hurt, that regret, that guilt can carry into even the marriage. Okay? And your view of your spouse can be tainted by your previous relationships, right? If you've had a bad relationship, you've committed fornication with someone, some man has used a woman, that woman might think, well, all men are like this. All men like that former relationship that I had, that former, former fornication that I had in the past. All men are like this man. And, you know, you might unfairly view your husband in that sense. You know, you know, all, you know all men just want one thing. You know, men don't want... You know, you know, his, my husband's not looking out for the best of me because in their minds, they're thinking about that former you know, fornication and unfairly tainting their spouse in that way. Or, or men who have fornicated in the past might look at women at that time and say, you know, just women can be disrespected, women can be used, women can be you know, t you know, used and, and thrown away. And then they might take that mindset as well to their marriage, you know, they're, 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 they're what's supposed to be their godly Christian marriage, and view their wife in that way. Well, she's not worth, you know, she's not worth anything. You know, she's just like any other woman, you know, uh, you know and, and it's just to be taken and, and, and not, not cherished, not loved. You know, I don't know if you guys know this, but while I was in Chile, there was this uh, documentary on 60 Minutes of an independent fundamental Baptist pastor who totally abused his wife, was totally disrespectful for her, did not love her the way Christ loves the church, totally using her just for pleasure. And, you know, his mind was corrupted. It wouldn't surprise me if even before he became a pastor, he was caught up in fornication, caught up in who knows what, you know, pornography and all of that, and it's tainted his mind, it's tainted his marriage, they got divorced, and now it's on the, on the show for the whole world, 60 minutes, you know? What a disaster. So number four, it'll bring you regrets and unnecessary burdens that might carry on to your, your marriage relationship. So it, it can cause a strain in your marriage, okay? It's something you need to overcome. It's something you need to confess to the Lord and be done with if, if it's something you've done in the past, okay? And the fifth reason why you shouldn't commit fornication is it'll get you kicked out of church, okay? It'll get you kicked out of church. That's why I'm preaching this today. But the question is, how do we overcome fornication? Because fornication is such... You know, committing uh, sexual acts is such a natural desire between man and woman, right? It's a, it's a godly thing. It's a righteous, good thing that's supposed to be had within the marriage, right? The marriage bed is undefiled. It's something between husband and wives. And so it's, it's a sin that can trap you, you know, if you're not careful. Because it, it, is, it does appeal to your natural desires, right? But two ways we can overcome fornication. I'll just read it to you from 1 Corinthians 6.18 because we already read it. 
flee fornication. Flee fornication. Run away. If you're ever in an opportunity, if you're ever in a time where you think this opportunity could cause me to commit fornication, I'm being tempted, you know, I'm alone with this individual, I could commit fornication. Flee! Get out of there! Run! That's what the Bible says. Flee! Get out of there. Physically get out of there. That is one legitimate way to overcome fornication in your life. Okay? I'll read to you Genesis 39, the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife. Genesis 39, verse 7. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph and she said, Lie with me. But he refused. Joseph's a good man. He refuses. And said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in, in the house, and he that committed, committed all of that, sorry, all that he hath to my hand. So he says, There's no way that I can commit adultery or fornication with you, Potiphar's wife. Your, your husband, the master, has given me so much. He's given me these responsibilities. Verse number 9. There is none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee. So Potiphar loved Joseph so much. He goes like, you can rule this house. You can have everything in this house, obviously except for my wife. Because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And it came to pass, as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. Now this is where, you know, Joseph's doing the right thing. This is probably, probably where Joseph made a mistake. Day by day, every single day, Potiphar's wife is asking Joseph to lie with her. And he seems to put up with it. You know, he says no, no, no. Probably thinks he's mad enough to, you know, and he was. He was mad enough to overcome it. But he put himself in a position which destroyed his testimony, even though he never did anything wrong, okay? My advice to you, if there's a woman, man, that's seeking you, put her away immediately. Don't put up with it time and time again. Just deal with it immediately. Otherwise, you could be falsely accused of something, which was what Joseph was falsely accused of. Verse number 11, And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, so he's just working, and there was none of the men of the house there within. Another mistake. There was no one else in the house, just him and Potiphar's wife. He knew Potiphar's wife was after him. Now there were no men in the house. Joseph should have said, look, there's no one else here. I'm, I'm, going, I'm, going, I'm going to take care of the garden. I'm not going to be in the house, right? And this reminds me of, I had a job where I was looking after a, 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 a number of, because of, it was a call center, there were a number of ladies, right? And I got into a management position where I had my own office. And that office, the blinds were always down for the, from the previous manager. My HR manager came up to me and said, Kevin, I know you're a good man, but let me give you one word of advice. When you go into that office, I want you to roll up the blinds and have them completely open. And I'm like, why? He goes, because you, you deal with so many ladies in the workplace, you don't want to be falsely accused. You know, those, those blinds are down, she can say something happened. He goes, I've seen it happen before, I've seen people lose their jobs and be falsely accused. So I took that advice on, this is not a godly man. This is just a HR manager, ungodly, you know, I think he was a Hindu man, I don't know. He gave me this advice, and I took it on board, absolutely. Rolled up those blinds, made sure it was all open, took away anything that could block the view, so that every time anybody walked past, they could see my office was open. If I was talking to someone about some private matter, the door was closed, but anybody could see through that office, right? I never wanted to be left alone with a woman, okay? Same thing with church. Same with thing with church. If I ever give counsel or advice to a woman, either your husband's got to be there or my wife's got to be there, it will never be one-on-one, -on -one, okay? Never ask me, Kevin, can you give me one-on-one -on -one counsel? Not going to happen, okay? It's never going to happen. And verse number 12, And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. So he obeyed the command, flee fornication. He fled. He got out of there. Unfortunately for him, he was falsely accused of attempted rape and then thrown into prison. But that is a legitimate way to overcome fornication, is to just get yourself out of there. Okay, don't, don't explain yourself. Okay, if you're in a workplace and you find yourself with a woman who's been over, you know, flirtatious or whatever, just get out of there. You don't have to say anything, just get out of there. That's what the Lord wants you to do. 
The second way to overcome fornication, I hope you see in 1 Corinthians chapter, turn to chapter 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2. The second way to overcome fornication, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. I've already preached on marriage, but that is one, another legitimate way to overcome fornication. Get married. Get married. Look, mums and dads, if your child, as they grow up, you know, we've got young children, but once they grow up, if they find a godly Christian man or a godly Christian woman, don't prevent them from getting married. You, you might, by doing that, you might even cause them to fall into the sin of fornication. You put off your marriage, you're going to increase the time and the opportunities for you to commit fornication. And um, I, I don't know if I used this example before, but in, in Chile, okay, in South America, Chile, education's a big thing. Like in Australia, you don't need to be that educated. You can get a job and, and have a decent wage. You know, nobody suffers in Australia. Everyone's, you know, every, you know if, you, if you're homeless, you, you're doing it on purpose, basically. But in Chile, here's the thing. Many of the ladies, they go through high school, they go through school, then they go to university. Now, I would strongly advise girls, you don't want to waste your time in university. You find a man that will provide for you, you find a Christian man that will provide for you, okay, and you get yourself ready to be a wife, but they go into these universities, they go into the higher education because, and I ask the questions, why do you, because I'm asking, I'm talking about Christian parents here, I say, why do you allow your daughter to do this? Well, it's like, well, just in case the man she marries leaves him. At least she's got something she can provide for herself. But by doing that, are you getting ready for a stable marriage or are you getting ready for divorce? <laughs> right? You're getting prepared for divorce, aren't you? If you're saying, look, I've got to get this education, I've got to get this kind of um, qualifications and career, just in case my husband leaves me, at least I can provide for myself. Well, you're preparing for divorce. Why aren't you preparing for marriage? Why aren't you preparing to be a godly spouse, a godly wife? Okay? and learning from the Word of God so you can be a blessing to your husband, guess what? The godly Christian man is going to find that woman more attractive than the woman that's trying to build her own career and be her own woman, okay? <clears throat> I don't even know where I was going with that. <laughs> anyway, don't delay marriage is my point. Don't delay marriage. And look, I believe, and especially young men, you go to school, I reckon you should, you, the first thing in your mind, once you finish your education, is, I know the Lord wants me to get married, I know fornication is wrong, okay? I know I'm going to get these desires one day to be with a woman or to be with a man, especially, you know, the boys, start thinking about work. Start thinking, hey, what can I do that will get me into the workplace? What will get me money so I can provide for myself, provide for my family, provide for my wife, have children, raise my family? That ought to be on your mindset. I'll tell you why. Because when the godly Christian woman walks your, crosses your path, she'll see that Christian man and say, wow, look at him. He's able to provide for me. He loves the Lord. He's trying to serve the Lord. He's not out there just with his mates, wasting all his money. He's responsible. He's, you know, he, that's a man that I want to marry. That's what's going to attract a good Christian woman, is a man that is ready to provide for his house, okay? Now, you might say, but Kevin, you know, our church is small. When our kids grow up, there might not be any, you know, spouses, any... Look, we have faith in the Lord. We have faith that if we pray, the Lord will answer our prayers. And here's the thing. If your children are growing up with the mindset, you know, I'm going to get married one day. Boys, I better start working. So I better start providing. better start, you know... Um, working toward that goal. Girls, you know, I better start thinking about what does God want in a, in a godly lady? How can I be a, 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 a godly spouse? You know, and, and start putting those things into practice. I promise you, you start putting the things of God into pray, play into your life, and you pray and ask God, look, I'm preparing myself. Can you please send me a God Christian man, godly man in my life? I promise you God will do that. As long as you are obeying the word of God, okay? Don't have in your mind, they're not out there. They're out there. God will provide a godly man, a godly woman for you, okay? But put into practice the things that God wants you so you can prepare for marriage. Why? It's not a topic, it's not a sermon about marriage, but so that you would avoid fornication, not be tempted by fornication. Um, I had some other points, so I'll just skip over them. Just in conclusion, in conclusion, guys, fornication will get you kicked out of church. I don't want anybody kicked out of this church, honestly. But that's the Word of God, okay? And I would 
especially parents, you know, and this happens in churches where, you know, parents are uh, members of the church, their kids grow up, teenagers, they go and commit fornication, and then it's a really sad thing when the pastor has to step in and kick their children out of the church. Okay, it hurts the families, all right? It hurts the families. But you need to decide and say, yes, you know what, Kevin, even if my own kids commit fornication, I, I recognize that is in the Word of God. I recognize that's what we are to do because we're here to worship God. We're here to please Him. We're here to obey Him. That I would support you, Kevin, if you had to kick my own children out of the church. And let me say this. If my children commit fornication, okay, pastors' kids don't get a pass. Again, I see this happening in churches. I see people get kicked out of church or run out of church because of some sin. Then the pastors' kids do it. It's like, oh, that's okay. You know, we'll just turn a blind eye to that. No. If my own kids are found committing these sins, committing fornication, then I will kick them out of the church. I'm telling you, that, why? Because I'm here to please the Lord, right? I'm not here to please myself or ourselves. We're here to please God. We see how much God hates this sin. We see how his anger was kindled where he had 24,000 Israelites killed over this sin. Let me just read to you again, Numbers 25, verse 7. And when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, and the son of Aaron the priest saw it, he rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand, and he went after the man of Israel into his tent and thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. Guys, I want to be like Phineas. Okay? I want to, if, if, if it's in our church, symbolically, I want not literally take a javelin, symbolically take that javelin and put that person away from the church so God's anger would not be upon the church in Caloundra. Okay? So please, you know, kids, this probably, you probably think this doesn't apply to you, but one day it will. Parents, make sure you raise your kids to understand these truths. Make sure they understand the importance of preparing themselves for marriage because that's where God's going to bless them, right? Not in this worldly system trying to you know, make sure they look out for number one and then what do you know? Before you know it, they're adding university. You know, desires have become greater than ever. They're more alone ever than ever with the opposite sex and then before you know it, they're committing fornication. And it's just a, it's just a shame. Okay, let's pray.